Hi friends, I am Melissa. Thank you for joining with me today. Um, today, my video is going to be about, ironically enough, sleep disturbances. Uh, yeah, we just finished the holidays. We just finished Christmas. We just finished New Year's. Uh, moving head first right all into January. And yeah, my body has very physically been impacted by my grief. And this holiday, um, <laughs> I mean, I had a lot of symptoms, whether they felt like flu symptoms, COVID symptoms, you know, uh, just, yeah, those typical symptoms, all of those. I experienced them very greatly for about two and a half weeks and actually, honestly, still am. I really don't feel like myself. I just don't, you know, and um, four years ago, you know, my two youngest children were brutally murdered by their oldest brother and my body is physically greatly impacted in my grief and probably will be my whole life, I imagine, you know, um, but today I just wanted to kind of focus more on sleep, you know, and sleep, it's such a big part of everyone's life. We all know that. We all know how important good, adequate sleep is. You know, we all know what it does to us when we pull an all-nighter, you know, and how we feel that next day with inside of our brains and our bodies. And then when days and days and days start to add up in a row of lack of sleep or no sleep, how we feel. So, you know, us grievers, that's us. All the time, that's us, you know. Um, and even in sleep, we're not completely free, you know. So often sleep brings memories and dreams of Noah and Sophia and Malik too. And so I managed to catch a little bit of sleep here and there the first year of their death. But I didn't fully sleep through the through through a whole night that first year, for sure. You know, I very vividly remember that first year, you know, very sporadic sleep in and out and not sleeping through the whole night. And actually, if I were to be truthful, I still have yet to sleep through the whole night. Except it's a little different now. Um, basically, about four, three to four months after we buried Noah and Sophia, the Lord woke me up. Like I could feel it was heaven waking me up at 3 a.m. And I would be wide awake and a little anxious, maybe might be the better word. Um, uh, and just anticipating something. Like I just knew something greater than me was waking me up and was present with me in the morning. And it was, and it's actually like a lot of us consider 3 a.m. the middle of the night, not necessarily the beginning part of the day, right? And that actually still goes on today, to this very day. The Lord wakes me up between 3 and 4 a.m. every morning, and I spend a good part of my morning with him until the sun rises and even past the sun rising. And those hours, they just pass by like minutes. Truthfully, they really, really do. And um, yeah, you know, and, and, and sometimes I wonder, you know, was that the time when Sophia went to heaven? It was around 3 a.m., give or take. You know, it's just interesting that time. You know, um, I did recently quit my job. Um, so now I will be able to rest my body more at home. Um, but I did previously for the last three years needed to leave my house at 5.30 in the morning for work. And so I know that was God. That was his faithfulness to wake me up so I could still have those intimate moments with him. And a lot of those moments were just spent crying, pouring out my heart to him, you know, pouring out a whole bunch of questions that I have for him, you know? Yeah. You know, in grief, we can have so many nightmares that we just begin to expect them. You know, and from what I, when I talk to other grieving mothers and fathers, sleep disturbances, this is natural and this is common. Yeah. When we're grieving, you know, for our sleep, 
to just take a back seat, you know. Um, all of our normal biorhythms, they've all been upset by our grief. You know, our systems frequently interprets loss as a threat. You know what I'm saying? So our bodily systems, it's just, I think it's kind of natural. We take loss as a threat. And so it literally sends us into that fight or flight mode. It does. And so that's how we feel in grief, you know? And it's, so it's hard to rest. It's hard to sleep and relax. Our brains are sending these danger signals <laughs> to our organ system. You know, it literally is, you know? So we kind of always feel like we're in danger. PTSD, always on the edge. And especially at night where this horror occurred, you know, going to sleep. Am I safe to sleep at night? Will someone come into our room and try to harm us? You know, natural for us, for our situation, for our horrendous thing. Yeah, you know. You know, I do try to sleep and relax, but the quiet can get the better of me. You know, my mind spins around and most of my thoughts have to do with my children. All of them, all five of them. It really does, you know, and uh, so, yeah, the quiet can just get the better of me. So I find myself constantly with some type of music on in the background. I really do. Um, or even maybe a TV, even though I'm not watching it. But most of the time it'll be music and just kind of keep that playing through my phone. I just leave my music on, leave my worship music on, my playlists on all day throughout the day, you know, and it, and it really does help me. You know, it does. You know, I naturally dig up questions and old ones too at that, you know. Yeah, I can ask a lot of questions. Yeah, I sure can. You know, like, why did this happen? How? You know, what could I have done? How do I live through this? Yeah, and I think, how is Malik? How is prison? What is prison like for him? You know, maybe what are some things he's not telling me because he doesn't want me to worry and be concerned. So what things of him that he's not telling me about his experience in prison? You know, he's trying to put on a brave face, a courageous face, you know, trying to face his responsibility and not run from his consequence. So yeah, I got a lot of questions. And they repeat themselves, you know, over and over. They do, you know. Like I said, the minutes turn into hours, you know. And if I'm lucky, <laughs> I'll drift off from time to time, you know, basically if I'm lucky enough, you know, you know, so when I do sleep half of the time, I'll wake up with like a start. Like I just, I just wake up and I'm either screaming or moaning or groaning, you know, and a lot of times I, most of the time, I don't even know what it was I was dreaming. That has to be the Lord's grace. So my day isn't walking around with the nightmare going on because the reality is a nightmare in enough in itself. Yeah. You know, I just have this sense of being somewhere else that's just much more pleasant and unhappy. So then like when I awake, I'm, I'm back in this reality of grief and sorrow, this new place that I live in because we moved out of our old house, you know, um, the terrible disappointment of reality. So I feel like maybe most of my groans and moans are that just waking up to my terrible disappointment to the reality that I am missing half of my children. You know, many people think dreams are an outlet used by our subconsciousness to work through what our conscious mind cannot do. You know, a lot of people feel that way. So if dreams can be another way which we process our grief, if that's true, you know, if you believe that, if people believe that, 
you know, that our dreams is, is the unconscious part of our brain doing what the conscious part cannot do. So yeah, maybe in our dreams, we are working out our grief, working through it. I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a dream expert at all, you know, and I, and I know sleep comes from the Lord, you know, so, so no wonder I dream about my children. I love and miss them very deeply, you know, so sleep, you know what? I actually read this in one of my grief journals that it said sleep deprivation is one of the most common forms of torture. Wow, isn't that just like a wow moment? It's said to be the most basic form of torture, I think. The most basic form of torture. Sleep deprivation. Yeah, we sure do feel tortured when we ain't sleeping, don't we? And like we just can't escape that feeling the next day when we're so run ragged, you know? And, and over time, it begins to take its toll on our bodies and on our health. It does, not sleeping well, you know. And most of us, we need help dealing with the confusion, the pain, and the anger that so often leads to insomnia, you know, and sleep disturbances, you know. We need help dealing with that stuff, you know. None of us should be alone with our nightmares. We're suffering enough already. We are, you know. So lack of peace Lack of safety, lack of security and closure will usually and always do result in a lack of sleep. You know, there, it, that is just natural and common in experience for hearts that are shattered by child loss. This is just so natural for us to feel this way. We have lost our children. They are dead. Sleep does not come easy for us grieving parents. It does not, you know? So for some of you who get good sleep, you probably don't even, probably don't think much about it. You know, you go to sleep, you get your eight, nine, 10 hours and you're up and moving the next day. But did you realize there's a whole community of us grievers that aren't sleeping? And then we were, we're made to go operate out in the world. We're made to go drive vehicles, go to work. So maybe the next time a cashier makes a mistake or you know, the CEO of a company or whatever. Maybe they're grieving and maybe they didn't sleep. Maybe they haven't slept in years and it's affecting their work, which then affects us as the customer. But we're, you know, do you see what I'm trying to say? Like we're all tied into this thing together some way, somehow in different ways, you know? And so us not sleeping as members of this society, as human beings, that affects us greatly and it's affecting those around us and in the people that we interact with, whether on a personal basis or like at the store on an impersonal basis, you know? Yes, I got my notes. So, you know, yeah, even in my sleep, I think of Noah and Sophia and Malik. In my sleep, I do. The brain <laughs> definitely does not shut down in sleep. Well, Mine doesn't, at least. <laughs> you know. Have you experienced changes in your sleep since your child has died? How so? You know, how so? Have you had dreams or nightmares about your child and their death, his or her death? You know, it, it's interesting. You know, maybe we, we sh I started writing down these dreams and I also started sharing them you know, with my husband and, and yeah, it makes a difference to start describing the ones that leave an impression on you, you know, that you just kind of keep thinking about day after day, you know, I just want to encourage you grieving parents that sleep disturbances are common. There's nothing wrong with you for not being able to sleep. There's nothing wrong with you because your mind doesn't want to settle down. You lost your child. We've lost two children. The mind is having a very difficult time settling down. Yeah. Processing our grief and moving back towards some kind of half-assed, decent sleep pattern is important. 
it's important that we somehow get back to a little bit of a decent sleep schedule or naps during the day, relaxing. I do way more relaxing than I do napping, you know? And like I said before, earlier, and if I'm lucky, I'll drift off to sleep during that. You know, I'll do some latch hooking or space off watching TV or even editing a video. And then I find that I have drifted off to sleep during all that. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's right, you know. But I think we, we just, yeah, we got to remember to breathe. Breathers, breathe. You know, breathe. Take some real good deep breaths before we go to bed. You know, uh, definitely we got to be able to talk to somebody. You know, we've got to be able to talk to someone, someone we trust. Yeah. Yeah. You know, getting it, it out. Getting it out is important. That's what's important is getting it out. You know, and for me, I, 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 I enjoy praying. I know the Lord is with me, even at times when I don't feel it or my circumstances are screaming out of control. You know, I'm just choosing to continue to believe he's with me, holding me by my right hand. His word assures me that he is watching over me as I sleep. You know, he never slumbers. He never sleeps. So even in my nightmares, I can rest assured that I'm safe you know yeah I just have to refuse to choose to not believe the lies to trust God he can still be trusted even though my children were murdered yeah the Lord can still be trusted even though my children were murdered he is faithful. Yes, sleep is hard for me. Yes, sleep is hard for me. Night can be difficult. And I'm very much always anxiously wanting the night to go quickly. You know, and I know the Lord knows that. That's maybe why he wakes me up at 3, 4 in the morning. 3 a.m., 3.15, 3.43, whatever. Because sleep can be tough. You know, my mind is never quiet. And so, yeah, it's like the Lord knows. And he just like, yep, just kind of get me up and get my day going with him. And those hours pass by like minutes. They really do. And sometimes I can feel behind. You know, it's like before I know it, sometimes it can be like 7 a.m., 7.30. And I'll actually feel late, you know, like, oh my gosh, I'm late. I'm late. You know, late for what? I don't know. I ain't going nowhere. <laughs> you know, but whatever. The point is the hours pass by like minutes, you know. So I, I think the most important thing for us guys, just resting has its benefits, you know? So if we can't sleep, rest, rest, rest. <laughs> you know, I rest frequently. Like I said, you know, sleep can be tough. Natural and common in grief, in grieving parents, grieving, grieving people. And then you add grief on top of grief. And my mother died a year ago. My father died three months after her. So yeah, I'll have nightmares about my mother quite a bit too. And dreams of walking into her bedroom and finding her in heart failure. You know. Yeah, grief piled on top of grief. Nightmares piled on top of nightmares. But I'm not alone in this. You are not alone in your sleep disturbances either. And guess what? Since I'm up at 3 a.m. pretty much every day, Feel free to message me. Feel free to send me a text message, an email, a comment on my social media. If you want to talk, if you want to cry, yell, scream, pray, really, no time of the day is not okay. You know, us grievers, we operate on a really different schedule than the rest of the world. We do. So we get it. We get it. Uh, well, I'm going to end this video because, you know what, I didn't get hardly much sleep last night, you know, and the Lord woke me up again early this morning and I've already been up for maybe about four or five hours. The rest of my house is still asleep, um, but, you know, it's good. It's good. It allows me to process my grief in such a personal way, you know, so I pray that for you. I pray the Lord will put you to sleep.
and wake you up with his love. Oh, well, God bless you, brothers and sisters, and be well today. And I will see you on the next video.